I think what has to happen is all of our elected representatives have to hear more from a broad cross-section of liberals, libertarians, conservatives, people who just want to say, this is too much big government, we want our, our government back. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Susan Herman, who's the president of the ACLU, but also the author of Taking Liberties, The War on Terror and the Erosion of American Democracy. Susan, thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Nick. Thanks okay. for having me. We've discussed that I can't pronounce most names that are going to come up in this conversation <laughs> already, but it's not covered in your book, but it is very much in the news, the killing of the American citizen Anwar Al-Awlaki. Al 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 Okay, uh, of the U.S. on direct orders from the president. The ACLU filed a lawsuit on behalf of Al Awaki's father last year or in July. What was your lawsuit and how does it play into what happened? Well, our chief concern about this case was the process, that we don't know what the criteria are that the president has been using and what the limits are. On and the this is, he has a kill list, right? Or, I mean, this is what we, we only know this yeah. through leaks. We don't know this right. because any information has officially been given to the public. Right. But to me, if the Constitution means anything, it has to mean that the president can't just designate an American citizen to be an enemy and then kill them. And this wasn't even in a theater of war, a theater of formal war. So the theory is if you can kill somebody, an American citizen in Yemen or, or Pakistan, why not Barcelona and why not Washington, D.C.? He hasn't uh, refuted any of this, but he's also not confirmed it officially. But how unprecedented is it for an American citizen to order the assassination of another American citizen? A lot of that yeah. goes you know, behind the curtain. You know, I, I think you know, there are not a lot of form, certainly there's no permission to do right. such a thing. And I think what it, this gets to is it's one of the derivations of the concept that we're at war mm -hmm. and that this is an untraditional war and therefore right. the president has untraditional powers. Let's talk about that because uh, George Bush talked about the war on terror, the war on terrorism. Are we at war? And if so, does that justify kind of wiping away a bunch of liberty? I was a philosophy major in college and I've often learned that if you're having a discussion, it's good to define your terms. Mm -hmm. And to me, the very definition of war includes an element of politics that there's a, somebody on the other side you can negotiate with, that everyone understands what the rules are, that people wear uniforms, that there's a confined theater of war, and that the war can end, it can have a treaty and a termination date. And you know, when does the war on terror end? And you know, who, who surrenders, who writes the peace treaty? So okay, to me, so, you know, the yeah, metaphor so takes you too far. So we're not at war? Not technically, certainly. Yeah. And okay. you, there, not all the consequences of being at war would follow. In the case of Al-Qaeda, in the case of uh, terrorists who have, who have committed crimes on American soil, it's obviously not a traditional power, uh, state power, that you can declare war on. Um, is, how, do, how should we go after terrorists then? We're not saying Iran is responsible or even Iraq. I mean, we invaded them for other reasons, and we'll leave that out of this discussion. But how do you go after a group like al-Qaeda? Well, I think what you just said, Nick, was they've committed crimes on American yeah. soil. And I think that the criminal justice system has been really quite effective in, in prosecuting well, terrorists. Well, talk about that, because this is uh, people who push back and say, oh, you know what, if we have military tribunals, that'll, that'll help. Whereas, in fact, most of the successful prosecutions of uh, conspirators and uh, actors have actually come through the regular courts. That's right. We've had convictions of terrorists you know, for terrorist plots in the regular civilian courts. So far, the tribunals have not really come up with anything, partially because we're having a lot of disagreements about what the appropriate procedures should be and whether it's fair to just come up with procedures to try to get more convictions. From an ACLU perspective or from your perspective, uh, was the uh, killing of Osama bin Laden justified? He's legally? not an American citizen. Let me actually step back yeah. a minute on your question about what's justified here on, as in response to terrorism. There was a really interesting report by the International Commission of Jurists, which sent an eminent jurist panel of all sorts of people around the world for three years, interviewing all sorts of countries that had had challenges from terrorism. Mm -hmm. And after talking to them about how they had changed their laws in response to the challenge of terrorism and how that had worked out, their primary conclusion was that the countries that had done best were the countries that didn't change all their principles and all their laws to you know, rise to the occasion, but those that just shored up. 
their when legal you, When processes. you say you did best, that they actually secured the most prosecutions or convictions? But they or? also, you know, the, uh, the countries were sorry when they had yeah. sort of thrown away their principles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, you know, this Ireland and Argentina and right. Israel and all sorts of countries. So, you know, I think there's no reason to be selling our principles and you're know, just throwing them away. And this is fully a bipartisan kind of cashing out of constitutional protections because really the Clinton administration under Janet Reno That's was right. pushing for much of this already. Then the Bush administration created it. And then the Obama administration, I mean, Obama uh, was uh, lauded really during the campaign as he said that he would not be acting with the same kind of churlishness towards constitutional precedent that Bush did. But that really hasn't played out, has it? He's been different in some respects. I mean, he certainly has different uh, policies on interrogation techniques. Right. But as to the things I write about in my book, domestic you know, surveillance and the things that affect ordinary Americans, his policies really have not been any different. He wants all the same dragnets that President Bush wanted yeah, starting in the fall of 2001. Well, uh, we just celebrated the 10th birthday of uh, the Patriot Act, uh, which opened up a wide variety of new surveillance opportunities for the government. Right. Talk a little bit about that. How is the Patriot Act continuing to be a threat to American civil liberties? Hardly anything has been changed since the fall of 2001. There have been minor you know, um, adjustments here or there, but most of it is still exactly in place. And I'll give you one example. One of the powers that was enhanced by the Patriot Act that some people have heard of by now are the national security letters, mm -hmm. where the FBI can demand certain kinds of information from telecommunications providers, financial institutions, with no court order at all. The FBI or somebody in the federal government says, hey, I, this is a, an investigation about terrorism or national security concerns. Yeah. I write a letter, you have to give me... You must give me the information and you're never allowed to tell anyone I ask. And you mentioned financial financial institutions. How broadly is that defined? Well, it's an extremely broad definition. Financial institution includes not only banks, it includes car rental companies, jewelers, you know, casinos, right. all sorts of places. So the FBI serves the national security letter. And for a long time, I tell in my book the yeah. stories of the librarians and the internet service providers, six people who decided to challenge this. But what we discovered, partially because of their challenge, um, eventually we got some numbers. And it was in 2007 that the Congress first commissioned a report from the Inspector General about how this power was being used. So let me tell you, the period studied in that report was 2003 to 2006. In those years, 194,000 plus national security letters requests were served, you know, almost 200,000. The number of terrorism convictions at, in, in which there was evidence obtained in that way one. What happens to that information that is uh, compiled? Do we know? Or? Evidently it sits in government data banks forever. Yeah, I just read the figure, something like 34,000 people have access to all this information and the government just collects. I, let me tell you one more thing about the national security letters because the whole idea under the Patriot Act was make it easier for the executive branch to gather information. They shouldn't have to bother with courts. They shouldn't have to bother with congressional oversight. Give them the dragnet and just trust them to use it wisely. So when the inspector general did a study of how the uh, FBI was doing at policing itself, it discovered that you know, the FBI had created regulations for doing this and then had violated its own regulations two to three thousand times, two to three thousand times. Is there, uh, in the wake of that report and, uh, and whatnot, what are, what are the oversight, either the congressional or judicial oversights that have gone into place? Well, mostly the FBI tells us it's doing better. There's still yeah. not a tremendous amount of oversight. We just had the uh, most recent renewal of one of the controversial Patriot Act provisions was just this May, May 2011. And at the hearings on that renewal, two senators who were on the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senators Wyden and Udall, said that the, uh, the Obama administration has adopted a, what they called a twisted interpretation of one of the Patriot Act powers, which they said would anger the American people if we found out. So Senator Feinstein said, oh yes, she'd hold hearings haven't been in right. hearings. One of the constant rejoinders to this type of uh, conversation is to say, look, you know, first off, you know, terrorism is really important. It's an existential threat to America, whether or not that's the case, but only the guilty have something to hide. Why should we worry about the government collecting vast reams of data on people that we're not, we don't even know who the people are or why it's being uh, Okay, I think two reasons. First of all, the idea that collecting vast reams of data is going to somehow keep us safe. There's a step between the collecting and the safe. And that's that you somehow have the algorithms to figure out, you know, patterns of terrorism. A lot of the scientists, this is something I became very skeptical of in writing the book, a lot of scientists say we're just not there. It, it's true that Google and Amazon can figure out whether you're likely to buy this book or what to sell you, but there aren't the kinds of patterns of terrorism. 
second reason why I think we should be concerned is that with hundreds of thousands of requests, mm -hmm. that's not just information about guilty people. And once the government has all that information about people, knowledge is power. The framers wrote the Fourth Amendment into the Constitution because they were concerned that if you give the government too much discretion to do searches and seizures and find out everything everyone's doing, it gives them the power to do arbitrary or discriminatory enforcement. In give us one uh, quick example. There's at least one documented instance in uh, Washington state of an FBI agent asking a librarian who checked out a particular biography of Osama bin Laden and you know, targeting that. There have been many different people. Well, Muslims. why would anybody except a terrorist want to know anything about Osama <laughs> bin Laden? Why would right. anybody? Right. Because we're all yeah. thinking people and yeah. we want to understand right. the world. Yeah. And it seems to me that one of the problems with this whole you know, Big Brother-like regimen where the government knows everything that we're doing and we, conversely, don't know much about what the government is doing is that it really creates a chilling effect that once you know that you know, your librarian might have to tell the government if you're checking out that biography and that somebody might ask that question, well, why are you interested if you're not a terrorist, you're going to become reluctant to check out the biography. I tell the story of a graduate student at the University of Idaho who was prosecuted for uh, providing material support to terrorists because he posted links on a website. Some of the links were to what jihadists ex you know, said in explaining themselves. Did he support terrorism? No, he didn't. He was trying to promote a general conversation. Now, of course we should understand why, how jihadists explain themselves. Right. Let's uh, talk a little bit about another specific case that you mentioned. Uh, you use a pseudonym for a woman named Roya Romani who was, uh, she, now she's an Iranian or she was jailed and tortured in Iran for supporting a pro-democracy group. She gets political asylum and comes to the United States and then what happens to and her? And then she's arrested by the FBI and she is prosecuted for providing material support to the same pro-democracy group. And this group was uh, labeled a, a terrorist group under Bill Clinton. The politics behind this are apparently were that the Iranian government insisted that as, for it to have any possibility of, of talk or rapprochement, we had to declare their political enemy to be terrorists. There are other countries have looked at this and said, wait a minute, this isn't a terrorist group, it's a pro-democracy group. Roya Romani, when yeah. she was prosecuted for this offense of supporting this, this group, wanted to tell the jury that this is not a terrorist group, that it's a pro-democracy group. Right. And the courts ruled that she's not allowed to because what the government says is final. Wow. And that so to me is a real problem. You know, where the government is she behind now? What is she? She's appealing her, you know, she pleaded guilty finally. They wouldn't let her raise any defenses. Didn't matter that she yeah. wasn't interested in supporting terrorism. Didn't matter that, you know, th that she thinks it's a pro-democracy group. You're with the ACLU. Uh, we know from at least the 1988 presidential campaign that that's a liberal organization. Did you vote for President Obama in 2008? This would be me personally. The ACLU yes. is nonpartisan. Yes, we have absolutely. libertarian members as well absolutely, as liberal yes. members. And let me say. And that I hope that you have some conservative members. Oh, of as course. Well. Yeah. We certainly do. But did you vote for Obama in 2008? Well, I don't think I should actually be, you know, I don't want to be, you know, because I'm okay. here in my ACLU and author capacity. Okay. What I do want to say to you is I think we have common cause with mm -hmm. a lot of conservatives, too. Yep. I tell in my book about a lot of places where the Cato Institute, the mm -hmm. Rutherford Institute, right. very much agree with us and are bringing similar lawsuits and writing similar concerns about the big government involved here. Right. And I think, you know, no matter who's running for president, you know, my message to the candidates is the same, which is that, you know, we're the deciders, we're the government. So, I mean, there are people like Ron Paul and Gary Johnson running right. for the Republican nomination who are pretty outspoken on this type of thing. But how do liberals get Obama or the Obama administration to take them seriously? Because can't, I mean, this is part of coalitional politics. Can't they just say, hey, you know what? Uh, the Obama administration is going to be, you're going to vote for me anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to run ra roughshod over this area of concern. I think what has to happen, as you were saying, it's not just Obama, it's not just Bush, it's not right. just Clinton. Any foreseeable president will see that the political winds favor you know, looking tough on terrorism right. by keeping feeding us placebos, yeah. you, even if they are placebos. Well, so I think it has to be a broader coalition than only liberals. Yeah. Glenn Greenwald said, and I think right. this is right, he said that actually you know, um, things became harder for the Democrats in Congress to you know, uh, object to all these laws when Obama was taking right. the same positions as Bush because they were no longer being the opposition party. So I think what has to happen is all of our elected representatives have to hear more from a broad cross-section of liberals, libertarians, conservatives, people who just want to say, this is too much big government. We want our, our government back. Um, historically, is there a good example or a precursor where uh, these kinds of incursions on civil liberties, on very basic civil liberties, were rolled One back? One very good antecedent, I think, was the Church Committee. 
which after you know, the whole, you know, there's uh, people have been talking about this current movie coming out about J. Edgar Hoover. Right. You know, what's, you know, why, why should we worry about the FBI? Well, yeah. sometimes yeah. you know the FBI yeah. power can be abused. Sure. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was in fact spying on Martin Luther King and right. various people. The Church Commission, which uh, took place in the 70s and, and re revealed a huge host of uh, civil rights violations by the National Security Administration, mm -hmm. the CIA, the FBI. How was that successful, though? I mean, it, it revealed a lot of stuff, but then here we are again. Well, I think there were two ways in which it had some success. One was they wrote an amazing report about all the emergency you know, provisions that it, we had put into law that somehow they just get rooted and they stay there even if they're after the emergency is passed. They also managed in the 70s to come up with a sort of a compromise solution, which was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, to say let's have one set of rules for spying on Americans, which we want to be a little hard. The government should have to get a second opinion from a court, as opposed to if we want to know what the Soviet embassy is up to, right. hey, it's the Cold War, that should be right. easy. What's happened after the Patriot Act is that we've allowed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to be used more and more and more to spy on Americans. And it has, I mean, the FISA courts have become rubber stamps, haven't they? The, yeah. Oh, they, they approve upward of 99% of the government's applications. So a lot of the amendments that you, the ACLU, for example, is asking about the Patriot Act are really, they're, they're process amendments. They're, you, nobody is saying you, know, you can never get records. What they're saying is you should have to go to a court, you should have to show a court that you really have a reason to get the records. And so there's some check on whether you're being arbitrary or discriminatory. Are you optimistic about the ability to uh, kind of uh, uh, toughen up uh, constitutional protections of uh, individual citizens? Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen in the short run, but I think what has to happen, and you know, this is where, to me, we're back to kind of the framing of the Constitution and, and what the framers thought, it really depends on us. And I think we kind of you know, got a little off track in the fall of 2001. And again, I think this is a little bit the war metaphor, the idea that we have a commander in chief who's going to decide everything for us and that we don't get to make the decisions and we don't know enough and we should just trust the government to decide which of our liberties and privacy and due process we have to give up. And I think people have to figure out that that's not true. And that's only going to happen if people start asking more questions instead of just, you know, I think kind of putting our heads in the sand and saying, well, you know, it must be keeping us safe because, you know, we haven't had a major attack. Well, you know, cause and effect. I want to thank Susan Herman, uh, the president of the ACLU and the author of the new book, Taking Liberties, The War on Terror and the Erosion of American Democracy, for talking with Reason TV. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.